Uh, good evening, everybody. Today, as a part of a classroom series, uh, we have the presentation on ICU acquired weakness by Dr. Jitu Mol. She's a consultant, neuroanesthetist, and neurocritical care specialist in Caritas Hospital from Kutay. Over to you, Dr. Jitu Mol. Thank you, Dr. Sindhu. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, I'll be moving on to the topic. Today, we'll be talking about ICU acquired weakness. Now, muscle weakness is something that we commonly see in our ICUs, of course, especially in our neuro ICUs, but generally even in other ICUs, muscle weakness can occur. Now, this weakness can be due to a primary neurological disease. That is, uh, for example, if the patient has a massive stroke or a massive IC bleed, they will have maybe a you know, hemiparesis, a weakness of one side. Then patients with other muscle disorders, neuromuscular disorders, patients with GBS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, they can have an ascending type of, you know, weakness, muscle weakness. Patients post seizures can have, you know, totes paralysis. So in these conditions, patient presents with the weakness. That is, the weakness is often present at the time of onset. Or you know what is the cause for that weakness. Now, you have another subset of patients who have been in the ICU. They are critically ill for quite some time. And these patients, due to some unknown etiology, there is no exact neurological cause that you can pinpoint but they develop muscle weakness. Now, this entity is called as ICU acquired weakness. So, basically, by definition, ICUAW is clinically detected weakness in critically ill patients in whom there is no plausible etiology other than the critical illness itself. So, how do you classify uh, critical illness? Uh, I mean, the ICU acquired weakness. You mainly classify it into three categories critical illness, polyneuropathy, CIP. You have critical illness myopathy, which is further divided. You can divide it uh, histologically into a cachectic myopathy. That is, histologically, when you see, you will see that there is, you know, there's a lot of loss of muscle mass and breakdown of muscles. Then you have thick filament myopathy. Uh, here, where would you see histologically, there's loss of the thick filament, myosin thick filaments, and necrotizing myopathy. Then you have a third entity wherein there is an overlap. You have a polyneuropathy, you have a myopathy, and you have an over, uh, overlapping spectrum. And that is called a critical illness neuromyopathy. And many a times, uh, what patients present with is an overlap. Clinically, it is usually uh, quite difficult to differentiate between the three. You will have to do further evaluation and examination to actually determine what kind of a ICUAW it is. But generally, it is CIP, CIM, or CINM. Uh, now, what are the risk factors for a patient in the ICU to develop CIP or CIM? Obviously, patients who are critically ill, mainly due to severe sepsis, severe septic shock, refractory hypertension, patients with severe multi-organ failure, patients who are being uh, ventilated for quite some time, prolonged mechanical ventilation, prolonged immobilization, patients with increased duration of the multi-organ failure, and hyperglycemia. Then you have other possible risk factors as well. Age. Studies have shown that, you know, with in, uh, advancing age and more frailty, there is more chance of developing a critical illness, uh, myopathy or neuropathy. Female gender is more predisposed. Studies have shown. Then if the patient at the time of admission, depending on the severity of the illness of the patient, the type of admission, a patient who was more severe with a greater, you know, Apache 2 score, these patients tend to have a more risk to develop CIP or CIM. Then patients with uh, hypoalbuminemia, patients uh, with uh, hyperosmolarity, early administration of parental nutrition has also been uh, attributed as one of the risk factors. Renal replacement therapy, vasoactive medications, corticosteroids has definitely uh, been, you know, repeatedly been implicated as one of the major causes or risk factors rather for developing ICU acquired weakness. So nowadays, further studies have come which say that it is. I mean, we can still use steroids, but, you know, you have to adjust the dose and the duration. Then, of course, prolonged muscle blockade, neuromuscular blocking agents, when you give continuous infusions for a long period of time, like, you know, more than 48 hours usually. And patients who are on certain antibiotics like aminoglycosides, vancomycin, all these are the risk factors that have been, that have been attributed to the development of a CIP or CIM. Uh, now, so as you can see, you can also see what are the non-modifiable and what are the modified risk factors. That is, the non-modifiable risk factors are those like 
you know the patient is really sick that is very sick they have a severe systemic inflammation uh, sepsis multi organ failure they are critically ill high lactate levels female sex older age uh, who are very frail actually premorbid obesity has been found to have a protective role in preventing against the development of icu acquired weakness then you have the non modifiable risk factors uh, i mean you have the modifiable risk factors that is hyperglycemia you can manage you can you know take measures to control your patient's blood sugars in the icu then uh, parental nutrition starting parental nutrition early on that is before the first you know in the first 7 days itself if you start early parental nutrition there is a higher chance of developing icu acquired weakness i'll be speaking about it in the subsequent slides then of course again steroids prolonged use of neuromuscular blockades and if you give steroids along with neuromuscular blocking agents continuous infusion for more than 48 hours antibiotics prolonged immobilization so these are generally the risk factors for developing an icu acquired weakness the incidence of icu acquired weakness uh, is it varies from around 49 to 77% in patients with more than 7 days icu stay and the pre uh, prevalence of cim uh, myopathy after orthotropic liver transplantation has been uh, reported as 7% and 36% and 35% in status asthmaticus and acute exacerbation severe exacerbations of copd the likely cause for that they say is because you will be using high doses of steroids post transplant in patients with severe asthma severe exacerbations you know there is a higher use of steroids and that has been attributed to why these patients are at higher risk for developing uh, icu acquired weakness coming to the pathophysiology um basically you have cip polyneuropathy and cim that is myopathy now the polyneuropathy is basically when there is uh, an axonal degeneration of the nerves and because of which you know they are not able to transmit the impulses to the muscles when it comes to myopathy basically the two main factors that is involved is a muscle atrophy there is increased muscle atrophy and there is decreased muscle function this is a main reason why there is a uh, like you know a myopathy develops so uh, muscle atrophy now you know patients who are in the icu and critically ill they have lot of neuroendocrine alterations and these neuroendocrine alterations will usually impair the balance the catabolism anabolism balance of the body is often impaired that is there's usually more catabolism and breakdown due to activation of various proteolytic enzyme systems and there is usually a decreased anabolism also prolonged immobilizations in the icu or disuse of the muscles mechanical ventilations functional denervation due to immobilization all these can eventually result in increased muscle atrophy or loss of muscle mass along with loss of muscle mass there can also be loss of muscle function per se that is uh, like structurally the muscles may be damaged is alteration in the muscle you know structures like necrosis inflammation the muscle infiltration by adipocytes all these can affect the muscle function then the other factors are any axonal degeneration causing neuronal damage microcirculatory changes are another important uh, pathophysiological mechanism like when there is a micro circulatory change that is you know there is vasodilatation increased permeability this can impair the oxygen delivery and oxygenation and perfusion of your muscles and that can result in decreased muscle function it can also cause mitochondrial dysfunction which is again another important mechanism so when there is a mitochondrial dysfunction there is you know decreased formation of atp uh, there is also you know there is increased formation of free radicals there is uh, a lot of inflammation Uh, even hyperglycemia can in turn result in lot of mitochondrial dysfunction also another important mechanism is the insufficient autophagy that is uh, the mechanisms of autophagy get impaired resulting in accumulation of your you know the damaged organelles and proteins then there is there can be muscle you know decreased activity hypo excitability of your muscles and another important thing is your impaired ionic mechanism that is a membrane and ion channel the functions of the ion channels in your you know muscle membranes are impaired and this can result in a disturbed excitation contraction coupling so overall all this will eventually result the end result becomes there is increased muscle atrophy and there is decreased muscle function so this is just a nutshell that is there can be microvascular alterations there can be metabolic alterations electrical alterations and bioenergetic failure this is in a nutshell what eventually results in your icu acquired weakness now what are the clinical features how do you suspect icu acquired weakness in a patient who is in your icu uh, 
now sometimes the initi- the earliest you know your uh, hint in these patients will be when you give them uh, like a painful stimulus or so there will be a facial grimacing they will you know wince but there is no movement of their limbs and there is no reason why they should not move their limbs we were so busy managing the sepsis and the multi organ failure but somehow we realize that you know eventually over the period of days the patient is not moving his or her limbs it is usually diffuse and generalized can affect the proximal as well as the distal muscles it is symmetrical both sides equally being involved the weakness is flaccid the muscle tone is decreased and it mainly affects the limbs and the respiratory muscles that is it spares your it's a skeletal muscle weakness it spares your uh, you know the facial and ocular muscles the cranial nerves are usually spare autonomic function is usually not affected and uh, sometimes in uh, you know you suspect it when patient you know has you you experience difficulty to wean the patient you know there is no other reason but you know you're finding it very difficult to wean the patient of the ventilator in these situations you should think about you know could this patient be developing an icu acquired weakness so now what is a the criteria there is a criteria clinical criteria to diagnose icu acquired weakness that is uh, if the patient develops weakness after the onset of the critical illness the weakness as i said is generalized both proximal and symmetric uh, distal muscles it is symmetric it's and it spares the cranial nerves then you can have uh, either the muscle power that you assess by the mrsc some score now uh, you know what is mrsc score that is you know the grade power grade from 0 to 5 5 being a normal power and 0 being no contraction so you test your mrc uh, muscle power score in uh, five group uh, like six groups of muscles on either side of the body so you have six groups of muscles on either side and so totally it becomes 12 groups of muscles so when the total score tends to be 60 so if this patient has an mrc some score which is less than 48 and out of 60 it is less than 48 or if you take each muscle group the main score is less than 4 and if you notice this weakness you know, for more than two occasions separated by more than 24 hours it is likely that the patient along with the other criteria likely that the patient has an icu acquired weakness or if your patient is comatose or patient you know is not in a state that he is cooperative to do an mrsc score like you know he is not going to obey you he is sedated or something then a patient who has been on a mechanical ventilator that is also under the diagnostic criteria for icu acquired weakness and of course the final criteria be uh that the cause of weakness is not related to the underlying uh not related to the underlying critical illness has been excluded that means other than the critical illness other causes for the weakness has been excluded so that is how you diagnose icu acquired weakness now if you come to if you want to distinguish it uh, like you know is it a critical illness polyneuropathy or a critical illness myopathy clinically uh, it is very difficult to distinguish you really cannot distinguish cip as well as cim you need to do further electrophysiological tests now when you're coming just telling you uh, just a brief a slide on what are the electrophysiological basically you would need to do a nerve conduction study and an emg now in a nerve conduction study what you do is basically uh, on one of the muscles uh, you can see there in the picture we are uh, doing a median uh, motor nerve conduction study here you can see that the recording electrons are placed over the apb muscle on the right uh, hand so there you can see an active electrode uh, as well as a uh, a reference electrode and a ground electrode now devices are used to stimulate the nerve at various points so you stimulate the nerve either at the wrist either at the you know at the elbow or the brachial plexus or at the uh, axilla so whenever you stimulate the nerve you can you get a response on the from the the uh, recording electrons on the a- electrodes on the app will pick up that activity and what you see on the machine is your cmap a compound muscle action potential so uh, you can see here that uh, the lower picture you can see that uh, you have a latency that is the time it takes for the response to occur then you have a peak duration you have a peak amplitude and you have a total amplitude so and then this is about compound muscle as cmap the next entity that you should be aware of is a csnap uh, that is a sensory nerve action potential that is when you have sensory nerves now what you do is you keep stimulating uh, electrodes on the fingers or on the foot depending on which nerve you have chosen and then recording electrodes are placed uh, on the uh, more uh, like proximally we placing it over the nerve 
So the stimulating electrodes will give us stimulating current, and the rec like, uh, recording electrodes will record the sensor snap, the sensory nerve action potential. Then you also have EMG electromyography, where electrodes are placed into the muscle, and you pick up the electrical activity in the muscle at rest. And when the patient is asked to, uh, you know, extend or flex, that when there is a voluntary muscle activation, that scenario also you pick up the electrical activity. So uh, this is how basically you see the C map, the snap, and the EMG. So how do you distinguish if it's a CIP or a CIM? It is based on your nerve conduction study and your EMG. If it is CIP, the C map amplitudes will be decreased to less than eighty percent of the lower limit in more than two nerves. And the snap amplitudes are also decreased to less than 80% of the lower limit in more than. So the CMAP amplitudes and the snap amplitudes are both decreased. The conduction velocity is usually normal or near normal. And when you do a repetitive nerve stimulation, you won't see a decremental response. A decremental response on uh, repetitive nerve stimulation is seen usually when there is a neuromuscular dis uh, disorders. Okay, but in CIPCIM, you don't see that decremental response. Now, so how do you diagnose critical illness? Myopathy, uh, that is patient, obviously, clinically, he meets the criteria for uh, ICU occurred weakness. And here, the snap amplitudes is what you see. The snap amplitudes are more than 80%. In CIP, the snap amplitude was decreased. Here, the snap amplitudes are more than 80% of the lower limit of uh, normal because it is a myopathy. And here, you, when you do the EMG, in more than two muscles groups, you see short duration, low amplitude, motor unit potential okay see in cim you see short duration and low amplitude motor unit potential because there's loss of the muscle fibers and there is early or normal full recruitment with or without fibrillation potentials and then when you do a direct muscle uh, stimulation that is you put stimulating electrode directly into the muscle in a patient who's uh, comatose and like emg uh, you get the recording from a muscle which is at rest or you ask the patient to flex or extend the uh, limb but if the patient is comatose or paralyzed, you cannot do that. So what you can do is a direct muscle stimulation, where stimulating electrodes are placed directly into the muscles, and you keep giving currents until you see a palpable twitch. So in critical illness myopathy, on direct muscle stimulation, there is decreased excitability. And of course, when you do a muscle biopsy, you will see features of loss of muscle fibers, necrosis, and cachexia. So that is how you diagnose a critical illness myopathy. So, and critical is neuromyopathy, but basically it's an overlap of both. So, if the patient meets, you know, everything that he clinically he has the criteria for ICU awkward weakness, and you know, NCS study shows criteria for CIP as well as for CIM. So, this is basically a nutshell. In CIP, the CMAP amplitude in both uh, CIP and CIM are both decreased. The duration, however, may be normal in neuropathy, but in critical illness myopathy, the CMAP duration is usually increased. The snap amplitude is decreased in uh, critical illness neuropathy, while it will be normal or increased in myopathy. The conduction velocities are usually normal. EMG at rest and the motor unit potential during voluntary muscle activation. There you can see that in uh, critical illness polyneuropathy, you see long duration, high amplitude, polyphasic uh, motor unit potentials. Okay, But in critical illness myopathy, you see short duration, low amplitude motor unit potential. Then, uh, yeah, direct muscle stimulation in polyneuropathy on muscle stimulation, it is just a normal muscle excitability. But in myopathy, you see a reduced muscle excitability. Of course, if the diagnosis, the most definitive method to diagnose is a biopsy, which is rarely done. It's invasive, it is very rarely done. But if you do, what you see is uh, in case of a neuropathy, you see axonal degeneration. Okay, there is no demyelination. If you see demyelination on nerve biopsy, it is not, you cannot call it a critical illness polyneuropathy. It is basically your axonal degeneration that you see in critical illness neuropathy. Then if it's a muscle biopsy that you take, uh, well, in case of neuropathic patients, what you will see is denervation atrophy. While in uh, myopathy, what you see is muscle atrophy and necrosis, fatty day. Basically, a lot of muscle changes, atrophy and loss of function. So basically, it is based on your nerve conduction studies, EMGs and, you know, muscle stimulation. And finally, on your biopsy that you can actually distinguish both otherwise it is a clinical diagnosis so investigation is a clinical diagnosis you uh, actually need to investigate further i mean only if you know the diagnosis is very uncertain you're not sure at all or even after one to two weeks there's no improvement or the weakness is very severe only you only then you actually need to go ahead and 
investigate okay otherwise if it's basically a clinical diagnosis you try to you know treat it and prevent it otherwise you can if you really need to know the no complete and definitive diagnosis you can go ahead and investigate the patient now there are several techniques actually there are techniques to assess the peripheral muscles as i mentioned earlier isoacor weakness affects your limb muscles and it can affect your respiratory muscles so there are methods to assess each so obviously uh, peripheral muscles how do you do is you can do a mrc sum score okay but for that the patient should be cooperative he must be awake and comprehend he should be able to comprehend you know to prevent patients who are neurologically impaired due to you know brain trauma or anything of that sort they may not be able to comprehend and obey or you know exactly obey what you instruct them to do that so uh, otherwise if the patient can cooperate and you know he will obey then that is this is a gold standard mrc sum score is a gold standard it's non invasive it's reliable and valid it has a higher interrater reliability but of course the patient needs to be awake then it can be affected by positioning of the patient and the availability of limbs that is if the patient has severe pain there's a lot of immobilizing devices placed on the limbs you may not be able to check your mrc sum score and it's an ordinal scale from 0 to 5 uh, and you see the sum score that is you take the six group of muscles on both sides may giving a total score of 60 and uh, now because it uh, because of the limitations of mrc sum score in six categories they have also divided it into just four categories that is just see if the patient is completely paralyzed that is grade 0 grade 1 is if there is loss of function that is there is more than 50% loss of strength and grade 2 is if there is less than 50% loss of strength and grade 3 is normal strength so uh, in this if the uh, total score out of 36 if the score is less than 24 it's likely that they have a icu acquired vessel weaknesses present again it is a non invasive and bedside testing with excellent interrater reliability of course you have other devices like handheld dynamometry where you measure the hand grip strength and the quadriceps force and uh, they are also they are gold standards non invasive quick and easy uh, but you will not be you are really uncertain if it actually represents the global muscle strength and other tests are available like functional status score six minute walk test But usually we don't do that. We usually do the MRC sum score. Now this is a volitional test. Volitional test meaning the patient's cooperation is required to perform the test. Uh, now other the things, if the patient is comatose and not in a cooperative state, then you can do a electrophysiological studies to diagnose. That is, you can do a full nerve conduction studies. That is, you uh, do a nerve conduction study on multiple nerves on both upper limbs and lower limbs, as well as an EMG. so obviously as i mentioned you can see the c map the snap the nerve conduction velocity the fibrillation potentials motor unit potential it is mildly invasive you know you might have to put in emg or you'll have to put needle electrodes uh, requires training patient's cooperation is required to some extent at least especially for emg for a voluntary muscle contraction you would require patient's cooperation uh, or you can do a single nerve conduction study that is you just check the c map on one nerve that is a peroneal nerve on a motor nerve and on a sensory nerve you can check the snap amplitude now when you do a single nerve conduction rather than doing it on multiple nerves uh, if you do it on a single you know a single subset of nerves obviously it is shorter duration it takes on 5 to 10 minutes versus about 1 hour for a full ncs emg it is less painful non invasive and uh, here you don't need a volitional patient movement you just you just seeing the on stimulating you're just seeing the snap and the snap but if your peroneal or sural whatever you have tested that shows an abnormal result then you will have to follow it up with a full ncs to confirm the diagnosis and then of course you have direct muscle stimulation where if the patient cannot cooperate you just have to use a stimulating electrode and you will see you will be able to dif- uh, distinguish clearly between cip and cif but again it requires specialized training then other methods uh, to see the limb muscles ultrasound where you can see the muscle area muscle thickness fasciculations you can see you know infiltration of the muscles by adipocytes even in ct mri you can see the same then you have dual energy x ray uh, absorptiometry and bioelectrical impedance measures these all measures the body compositions so these are very rarely used and finally definitively if you want to know the definitive diagnosis is nerve and muscle biopsy only on that but these are rarely done usually limb muscle weakness can be diagnosed based on your clinical findings and if you want to take it further you can do electrophysiological basic studies usually it is a clinical diagnosis now if you want to assess your respiratory muscle function uh, well you have volitional tests and non volitional tests such as you can check the ma- uh, maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressures you can do a trans diaphragmatic pressure 
Now this is quite invasive. That is, uh, you measure the. You have to put a balloon. You put balloons into the stomach as well as into the esophagus, and you measure the pressure difference between the pressure in the uh, the balloon in the gas, the stomach, and the balloon in the esophagus. That's called the trans diaphragmatic pressure. So if a PDI is less than 60 centimeters of water, it usually indicates that there's a diaphragmatic weakness. But it is invasive and requires skills. It may be difficult to obtain. Then other, if the patient is, uh, and you ask the patient, basically in trans diaphragmatic pressure, you can ask the patient to take deep breaths, and you see the change in pressure. Now, if the patient is not cooperative, then you have uh, basically trans diaphragmatic pressure and endotracheal tube pressure can be assessed by stimulating the phrenic nerve. Okay, bilateral phrenic nerve stimulation by using a handheld device. It's usually a magnetic device, as you can see in the first picture here on the left side. It is placed on the cervical region. Uh, there's a magnetic coil in it, and it gives an electrical stimulus, a magnetic stimulus to the and stimulates the phrenic nerve, thereby causing a diaphragmatic, uh, you know, uh, contraction. And you can measure the trans diaphragmatic pressure. Again, it is not you are done. It's a quite invasive and not done. But what we can, or what can you know, draw the clue to a weakness, a diaphragmatic weakness is when you see your chest X-ray, you notice that the diaphragm position is elevated. Okay, and maybe one side of the diaphragm, or both the diaphragm seems to be elevated. But yes, the sensitivity and specificity is low. You can further confirm it on your bedside in your ICU by using ultrasound. So, an ultrasound, what you see is you need to see your diaphragmatic excursions and your diaphragmatic thickness. So you can see on the diagram on the right side. You can uh, initially you need to use a cardiac probe. You keep it in the subcostal view between the mid axillary and mid clavicular, uh, you know, lines. Initially, you see on the B mode, you can see a very bright white C-shaped, you know, hyperechogenic structure. And that once you get a good picture of the diaphragm from B mode, you can convert it into the M mode. So once you convert it into the M mode, you can see that you know you get this kind of a positive deflections. Okay. So this is basically your diaphragm expanding, and this is during expiration. So you measure the difference between the positive deflection and the lowest pressure. So uh, normally, in a quiet breathing, a patient who is normally breathing, in a just normal quiet breathing, tidal breathing, uh, it should be around 10 to 20 millimeters. Anything less than one uh, millimeter, like you know, one cent, ten millimeters, is considered to be a uh, weakness, weakness, or there will be a paradoxical motion of the uh, diaphragm. Now, during deep breathing, you are you can see that the diaphragmatic excursion is much more. That is, it's around six to seven uh, centimeters. So, if it's uh, they say if it's less than five, it definitely ensures that there is a muscle weakness. So, basically, you have to measure the diaphragmatic excursions during quiet breathing, during deep breathing, even during a uh, maneuver called sniff breathing, you can measure it. But usually, in your ICU, you can just measure the diaphragmatic breathing. But for this, uh, the patient should be able to take a deep breath. Then you can see the FRC. That is uh, basically you have to see the diaphragmatic thickness. That is here during normal respiration. What is the thickness? And during deep inspiration, patient, there should be a twenty percent at least increase in the, uh, you know, um, the thickness of the diaphragm. So if it is less than that, it usually indicates that there is a weakness. So these are things that you can do in the uh, your ICUs. You know, basically bedside you can do just to assess your diaphragmatic weakness. So and now I just briefly tell you what are the differential diagnoses of uh, acquired muscle weakness that you might see. Uh, you have a mnemonic known as muscles. M being medications. Steroids again is one of the major causes of muscle weakness. It has been implicated. Uh, exactly which one? They don't really you know it doesn't make a difference. So whichever steroid, but the dose and the duration, especially the duration of giving and the doses of the steroids make a difference. Then neuromuscular blockers and antibiotics, amiodarone, all these have been implicated. Then U standing for any undiagnosed neuromuscular disorder is so that's what you need to rule out that there is no other neurological disorder, okay, or under cause for this weakness. So you need to rule out other neuromuscular disorders. Then any spinal cord disease, ischemia, compression, vasculitis, demyelination, rule all that out. Then of course C comes critical illness, myopathy, neuropathy. Then L being loss of muscle mass, like the cachectic myopathy or rhabdomyolysis. There was an extensive trauma and muscle breakdown because of that. E electrolyte disturbances must also be ruled out: hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypermagnesemia, and then finally as for other systemic illnesses like porphyria, AIDS, vasculitis, paraneoplastic syndromes. Now, just briefly, how do you like you know what are the differentiating features of a CIP and GBS? So CIP is usually seen in a patient who is chronically critically ill. 
with sepsis, multi-organ failure. He's been in the ICU for a long period of time because he's, you know, really sick, uh, you know, critically ill. GBS is usually preceded by the muscle weakness, preceded by a history of a GI or a respiratory infection. And in critical illness, uh, polyneuropathy, usually it happens after the patient has come into the ICU, a few days after the ICU admission. While in GBS, it usually occurs before or at the time of ICU admission. And you have uh, in CIP, you usually have fairly symmetric limb weakness, sparing the cranial nerves. But in GBS, you usually have a progressive kind of weakness with frequent cranial nerve involvement. Uh, then in CIP, usually the sensory deficits are less prominent. When in GBS, pain is usually present. They usually complain of pain. And uh, electrophysiology, uh, CSF, if you see, CIP is usually normal. GBS, you have albuminocytological dissociation. Electrophysiology, on electrophysiological studies, you see an axonal neuropathy. But in GBS, what you see is a demyelinating neuropathy usually. Of course, there are also axonal neuropathy variants of GBS. But uh, know that if you see demyelination on your biopsy or on uh, you know, your electrophysiology, it is not a critical illness weakness. It is usually something else. And treatment for CIP, it's not, a, there is no specific therapy for CIP. It is usually to prevent the predisposing factors and, you know, rehabilitation and so on. But in GBS, yes, you have plasma pheresis, IVIG and so on to treat GBS. And uh, so this is how you generally distinguish between CIP and the GBS conditions. So as I mentioned earlier, how do you manage ICU acquired weakness? As said, there is no intervention that has shown to improve the outcome. There is no intervention that you actually do. The main treatment or your goal is to prevent the development of ICU acquired weakness. Identify risk factors, manage them in all critically ill patients, irrespective, uh, and optimize the rehabilitation for those patients in whom it has already developed. So it's basically prevention and rehabilitation. So what can we do in our ICUs, you know, to prevent? That is, of course, a good blood sugar control okay that is not just for icu acquired weakness even generally it is good to uh, it is very important especially in you know uh, septic patients patients with uh, brain injury and all that avoid hyperglycemia try to maintain a blood sugar of less than 180 and uh, early parental nutrition as i mentioned earlier is one of the advocated reasons for developing icu acquired weakness they say that when you administer large doses of macronutrients like amino acids that is a main culprit. It is not your micronutrients and macronutrients like amino acids. You think when you supply amino acids, you know, it's going to increase your protein synthesis. But rather, studies have shown that these amino acids are being, you know, broken down. They get broken down and they are shuttled into the uh, cycle for urea genesis. And also, amino acids at high doses are known to impair your autophagy. And impaired autophagy is another mechanism for the development of ICU acquired weakness. So, right now, the uh, what is advocated is you try to postpone your parental nutrition. Yes, you need to start nutrition as early as possible, but try to postpone your parental nutrition to beyond the first seven days. Okay, and that has shown to reduce the burden of ICU acquired weakness. Of course, there are still various studies, you know, what is the exact timing that you have to start parental nutrition? All that is still, you know, still being studied. Then, of course, avoid prolonged, you know, and unnecessary, you know, neuromuscular block, paralysis, excessive sedation. Try to give, you know, uh, sedation holidays in between and uh, then there are other you know methods like neuromuscular electrical stimulation which is found to be useful and then of course you have nutritional therapy antioxidant therapy glutam uh, glutamine uh, you know infusions uh, human recombinant growth hormone therapy has also been studied to be these are all newer things which are being studied IV immunoglobulins of course blood glucose control good physiotherapy so it's basically you prevent, you know, the prevented by taking care of the risk factors and, you know, uh, you know, overall a systemic evaluation and management. So the complications, you have short term complications and long term complications. Uh, you have your high, of course, short term complications means patients with ICU are quite weakness. You have difficulty to wean them from the ventilator. So there will be, you know, long duration of stay in the ICU hospital, increased mortality, prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation. And of course, extubation failure, about 50 to 80 percent of the patients tend to have an extubation failure, swallowing disorders, you know, these are the short term, the long term complications again, you know, delayed discharge, uh, then discharge to another hospital, rehabilitation center sometimes. Physically, you know, they will, you know, we tend to be more dependent. Okay, so these are the uh, complications, the short term and long term.
so now as i said you prevent the complication and the next aspect of managing is rehabilitation now this is very important in the uh, management of critically ill icu patients okay uh, basically what we need to know that is incremental activity must be undertaken right from the uh, icu throughout the hospital and into the community until the maximum level of functioning is achieved it is a continuous process avoid prolonged bed rest and inactivity unless of course it's indicated there's a reason why you know you uh, give a complete rest or inactivity but at after that indicated time period you need to you know give good physiotherapy and so on there is a you know concern that you know if you give uh, physical activity and mobilizing the patients can be harmful there can be accidental removal of lines pulmonary embolism arrhythmias and falls but uh, yes we have seen and we also in our icus we have seen that you know physical activities mobilizations exercise therapy they are safe and achievable provided that you know you do that once a patient is uh, you know stabilized individualized and it is in accordance with the protocol okay uh, an experienced team uh, okay a good team with experience done according to a protocol once a patient is stabilized must be done it is safe and it is achievable in the icu uh phase physical and mobilization therapies okay you begin with passive limb movements then you active movement then make the patient sit then from standing to walking so it's you know based on each patient it's a step by step process respiratory muscle training must be given weaning trials must be done intermittently you need to keep you know stimulating the patient to breathe otherwise uh, the thing and then you have occupational therapy of course you tra you know train the pa uh, patient to perform activities of daily living then you have devices such as cycle ergometry and you know other devices where your patient is being mobilized uh, from the bed in cycle ergometry you can see the patient might be on a ventilator but you have a like a cycle pedal the legs are strapped to that cycle pedal and the patient is you know uh, if the patient can move yes otherwise a motorized pedals will keep moving the patient's legs so this there are various kinds of you know uh, mobilization devices which have come then electrical muscle stimulation self help rehabilitation manuals so various techniques of rehabilitation and physiotherapy must be initiated as soon as possible prognosis 45% of the patients diagnosed with icu acquired weakness will die within their hospital admission they are usually critically ill patients and further 20% will die within the first year after icu admission uh, discharge and for those patients who do survive complete functional recovery occurs in 68% of the patients 50 to 68 while about 28% will have persistent disability some studies have shown that among the various types of icu acquired weakness uh, critical illness myopathy tends to have a better weakness not a definitive this thing but uh, there are studies which have shown that so i would like to conclude this talk by saying that muscle weakness is a frequent complication of patients who are critically ill they have devastating short term long term complication and therefore you must be careful to prevent and manage the risk factors that can lead to this and if they have developed it you know give appropriate management and rehabilitation there are various new areas that are being studied uh, one of them being the infusion of ketone bodies and you know basically strategies to activate ketogenesis thereby you know improving the muscle functions and decreasing loss of muscle mass so these were my references thank you Dr. Sindhu?